Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. First, thank you so much, everyone, for taking time out of your schedule to be here with us today. Um, Dr. Lane and I got to experience some awesome voices from students and from parents this morning that really delved into what COVID-19 learning has looked like and perhaps what the future of that will be. So today, um, as you are you know, chiming in when we are asking you questions, I would love for you all to utilize the chat. I would also love for you all to utilize the raise hand option. We're gonna to try to be as equitable as we can in reaching all the different folks from local school boards to folks in the state houses um, all throughout Kansas and Missouri. We want to make sure that all voices are heard. Um, thank you so much for being here. My name is Kevin Kinsella. I am a English and social studies teacher, debate and forensics coach at, um, and Race Project KC sponsor at JC Harmon High School in Kansas City, Kansas. Um, I'm also part of the school reentry task force. So a lot of what I'm hearing today um, will be really valuable for when I take some of our thoughts back to that. Um, Randy and Yolanda are on there as well. And I thank you so much for the service that you do for our district. And now I'd love to hand it over to my friend, um, Dr. Cindy Lang. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, good morning to everyone. It's, uh, it's a thrill to be here with you today. Uh, just a reminder that we are being broadcast live across many social media platforms. And we uh, anticipate at the end of our conversation that we'll distribute those key points that were shared here today out with a broader audience. So we can all learn uh, from your wisdom and um, thoughts about where we're headed. So I am Cindy Lane, a retired superintendent, uh, a 38 year educator. Currently I'm the CEO of Evolve Education Leadership Consulting, which has been a remarkable experience. And I am a co-chair for Kansas Governor's uh, Council on Education. So we have a unique opportunity here today because we have members from both sides of the state line, policy leaders, educators, local uh, board members, uh, state senators and representatives, and we're looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely, thank you, Cindy. And now what I'd love for all of us to do is um, at least by the way that I'm looking at the screen, I'll call your name. And if you could say, hey, this is who I am and this is who I represent and then I'll call the next name just so we can acknowledge all the folks that are in the room today. So I'd love to start with my friend, Janet Waugh. Hi, I'm Janet Waugh, and I'm a member of the State Kansas Board of Education. And I represent, I am uh, District 1, which represents all of Wyandotte County, all of Leavenworth County, the eastern part of Douglas County, and a small section of Johnson County. And thank you for inviting me. Absolutely, thank you, Janet, for being here. Yolanda? Yes, I am Yolanda Clark, and I am a board member for the Kansas City, Kansas Public Schools, USD 500. So excited to be here today. Awesome, thank you. Senator Pat Petty? I'm happy to be here today. I'm Senator Pat Petty. I represent the sixth district. Uh, that's uh, a, a large portion of Wyandotte County, a small portion of Johnson County. And, uh, my career was in education. I was 36 years teacher in the Turner School District. Awesome. And Carol Cadu Blackwood? Yes, good morning. My name is Carol Cadu Blackwood, and I'm a Lawrence Public Schools board member, and I represent uh, Douglas County. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Randy Lopez? Hi, good morning. Randy Lopez, Kansas City, Kansas Public Schools Board of Education. Thank you for the invitation today. Um, I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. And Dr. Watson. Good morning, everyone. Randy Watson, Commissioner of Education. Thank you. And Brett Parker. Hello, everyone. I'm Representative Brett Parker from the 29th House District in Overland Park and a fellow teacher turned uh, legislator. Thanks, Kevin. You're welcome. And Dr. Van Dieven. Good morning, everyone. Margie Van Dieven, Commissioner of Education, State of Missouri. Awesome. And Kenny Rodriguez? Yeah, Kenny Rodriguez, I'm the superintendent of schools in the Grandview C4 School District. It's just uh, south of the Kansas City Metro. Awesome. Thank you. And Senator Sykes? 
Hi, I'm Senator Dinah Sykes. I represent the 21st District in Kansas, which is Lenexa and Northwest Overland Park, and I am a PTA mom, public advocate, and <laughs> turned senator. Thank you for having me today. <laughs> You're welcome. A lot on your plate there. And Representative Brandon Woodard. Hi, everyone. I am Brandon Woodard. I represent the 30th district in the Kansas House, which is Lenexa and Olathe. Uh, I'm a higher education nerd turned legislator and then the ranking Democrat on the House Higher Education Budget Committee. Perfect. And Representative Burnett. Oh, we can't hear you. It may be. Awesome, and we'll we'll try to work with your audio, um, Representative Burnett, and Charlie Shields. Yeah, so I'm Charlie Shields. I'm president of the State Board of Education in the state of Missouri, and uh, for all you legislators, I'm a recovering legislator, full <laughs> Senate president of Missouri. Nice segue to um, yeah, some folks in the state house. VJ. Hi everyone, uh, VJ Ramasamy. I'm on the governor's policy team, focused on some of the education priorities for the governor. Excited to be here. I see a lot of friendly faces. Thank you. And Ann Ma. Thank you. Um, Ann Ma, I am also a recovering legislator, I guess, just finishing up my first term on the Kansas State Board of Education. I have Shawnee County, Topeka, and surrounding counties. Good to be here. Awesome. And Representative Ann Kelly. Hello, I'm a 13 year educator and then legislator of Missouri in the 127th district. Awesome, and I wanna give a shout out to our ASL folks. So we have Billy Sanders, Dubois, Hitchman, and Carissa is doing our closed captioning. So today we have ASL folks that will be a visual representation for those folks, and we will have closed captioning as well. We definitely thank you for those services today. So I would love to kick it off with our first question, which is on the minds of a lot of folks that I've talked to. Um, so today, the first thing that I would like to talk about is, and this goes to policymakers, both sides of the state lines at both local and, um, and state levels and district folks. So how has the district policymakers state governor's office, how have they supported students, teachers, and parents during COVID-19 and distance learning? And yeah, um, Manny Barca, you can go ahead. Oh, sorry, I need to make sure. One moment. Um, Manny, we will come back to you. Is there someone else that would like to kick us off? as you think about that question, many of our constituents may not understand the relationship between state local decision making. Uh, so it might be helpful if someone could kind of frame what does that look like and then talk about uh, from your viewpoint what has been done to support schools during COVID. Well, I'll start. Thank you. <laughs> Can I, you want me to go ahead? Please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I think Kansas has done an amazing job. I'm so impressed with everything we've done. When this thing, when they finally, when they closed our schools, which we were the first state in the nation to close the schools, uh, we had, I believe, 72 hours. And we had a group of teachers come up with a continuous learning plan that we were able to give to our districts so we could continue with education. Even though schools, the buildings were closed, our schools continued. So I have just been amazed. and. Frankly, the uh, governor and legislature have been absolutely wonderful with everything they've done. And we've even received federal funding to help our schools. At the current time, we are uh, planning on reopening our schools. We have what we have is called as Navigating Change 2020. And we started this back in uh, May. We had a operations team and an instructional team where they looked at, uh, well, the operations team looked at uh, guidelines from 
other states, from the CDC, health departments and whatever to help them on that. And of course the instructional team looked at the curriculum and competencies and assessments because we possibly should go to a curriculum based instruction. And so then after that, then in the first, of the, the part, first part of June, uh, we, we, we divided into uh, more committees. We had an oversight team and we had out of that, we had an operations team and an implementation team. And the operations team was basically like how safety and health in our buildings and our uh, facilities. And uh, we had seven committees out of that. And then we had the uh, implementation, implement, implementation team divided, divided into four grade levels. And each of these had committees. And then each of these uh, subcommittees, these committees on there had subcommittees. So there were hundreds of people working on this. And currently they're presenting their plans to the, uh, to the next level, which is level three. And there will be educators uh, reviewing everything to make sure we kind of have everything aligned. And then we will, uh, on uh, July 14th, we'll have our board meeting when it, it will be presented to us. It's my understanding it's an over, it will be over a 500 page document that we will, uh, uh, we will vote on Wednesday to accept this. At that time, it will be distributed to our districts. And then our districts, of course, have the option, this is simply, suggestions that to implement it how they want to implement it and, at, and then we are, will continue looking at at that point we don't stop because <laughs> we're going to look at the implementation and how we will do professional development and things like that so it's really exciting what's going on we're looking at all scenarios we're looking at totally back in school abnormally we're looking at hybrids we're looking at totally virtual. We're looking at everything we could look at, hopefully, to make suggestions to our districts. Awesome. Thank you, Janet, and thank you for providing a timeline, because I think so many of us didn't know the process and how that looks, so I appreciate that feedback. And we have an additional panelist, Manny Abarca. If you could go ahead and introduce yourself real quick. Sure. My name is Manny Abarca. I am the treasurer of the Kansas City, Missouri Public Schools Board. Awesome, thank you. And uh, Dinah, you have raised your hand, so I would love to give the mic over to you. Uh, thank you. I um, will probably second everything that Janet said, so not reiterate, but I think Kansas did an excellent job. You know, we have learned so much since March um, and looking at the fall, being able to adapt to things that we did really well and things that we can improve. Um, for specifically, my, I have two boys who are in Olathe's public schools and um, the communication from our district has been phenomenal. You know, every week we got an update and kind of an outline of what was going on. Today, they did a survey for the students wanting to see what students want as they're going back to school. And then um, next week, parents will do a survey. So I have really appreciated the communication. And, you know, as our kids are learning continuously, I think our administration, state board, everyone has, you know, continuously learned um, and things that we could improve. So I have been um, really appreciative of everyone and their support. So. Yeah, VJ. <laughs> I, I just I have, have, to, to, I have to out VJ here. He's looking for the virtual way to raise hands, which usually <laughs> is available in Zoom, but we're giving people permission just to go old school today. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I appreciate it. I, I wanted to give a little bit of context. Um, I appreciate everything um, Janet and Senator Sykes were saying. I think uh, the decision to close school buildings um, was a difficult and ne but necessary one. And I think I just wanted to say that none of that would have been possible. We would not have been one of the first states in the nation to do that if it wasn't for the people that are on this panel and the educators and folks at the school board and folks on the continuous learning task force and all the teachers, parents, administrators across the state that made it happen. Um, the, that decision, and it was in consultation with a lot of the folks in this room, was made for two reasons, uh, for safety and certainty. Um, I have a public health background and I continue to believe that that decision um, in the beginning of this pandemic was one of the reasons why Kansas is where it is right now in terms of COVID-19. Um, and other states, and now there's a lot of research coming out that showed that 
um, closing school buildings and shifting to distance learning, although it's an incredibly difficult decision, was one that did save lives and helped decrease the spread of cases. So I just wanted to reiterate that from day one, uh, from the governor's office perspective, it was because of communities and because of folks like you that it was possible. I think about things like continuing school lunch. I know that we've had a lot of conversations with Dr. Watson, who's on this panel as well, about the incredible work that communities have done to continue to keep kids fed um, during this difficult time. And also, as we look to the future, um, we, I like Senator Sykes said, we've learned a lot. And one of the things that we've learned is that the pandemic has illustrated and highlighted um, inequities and, and issues in our society and heightened them. Um, and I think one of those things is access to broadband. And so I wanted to kind of add that into this conversation as one of the priorities for the governor's office, especially as we get funding from the federal government to make investments of how do we ensure that um, students across the state, especially in our rural areas when we, where there's, we know that there's um, access uh, to internet issues or affordability issues, how do we make sure that they have access um, if we do see a second wave, we need to move back to some sort of distance learning um, that kind of undergirds keeping students and families safe and also making sure that they have access to the tools that they need. So I wanted to echo the thank you and then kind of talk a little bit about how we're thinking about the fall. Yeah, thank you so much for that input. And really the, the delivery of all of these things, I think, goes down to the local school boards. Um, and, the, and the school, so I would love to hear from Manny and what they have been doing in KCPS. Yeah, I, I mean, kudos, right? I think VJ hit on a lot of points um, from the Kansas side um, and from the Missouri side. Um, honestly, it has been more challenging than I realized my colleague uh, Randy on the other side may have had. Um, we have found ourselves in a place of unknowns um, for everyone, right? I mean, this is not a, a crack at any specific person. Um, as much as just having to make decisions basically in the dark, unaware of where we're going, how we're going to be funded, how we're going to be evaluated. And, and it has been very challenging for us, um, especially as an unaccredited district, um, striving and on the cusp so close. Um, this moment may be a defining moment for our district, sadly, and not a positive one. So I hope um, that we will continue to thrive for um, the support um, as well as engagement from our end, um, but very much yearn for greater leadership and guidance here because uh, it is very challenging. Um, and as you know, I'm, I'm not a career educator. Um, I, this is my first term and my first year. Um, but even as treasurer, as I'm, I'm looking at the, the barrel of a looming budget crisis um, and, and our funds are being um, shrunk from some different formats, um, it is very challenging for us to make um, decisions um, without some of this. So um, I very much look forward to um, hearing um, more information about where we're going and what that looks like. Um, because even as we as we address um, the, digi the digital digital divide issues, um, you know we still have to figure out how we're going to um, be graded on some of that stuff when it comes to the state accountability side. So I know that you all uh, are very much coming up with those formulas and trying to figure out how we navigate all of this. So I look forward to that and I look forward to being engaged in that process um, going along. Absolutely. Manny. Oh, sorry, Kevin, go ahead. Oh, and I, I was gonna say, Cindy, unless you wanted to go in a different direction, I was gonna say that Manny provided a great segue into my next question, which revolves around equity in education and the way that it's been delivered. Um, and some other folks have said that the inequities, I think BJ said this, inequities in education have been highlighted through this time. Um, and how, how does that look going forward? And how can we improve on those things? Uh, many also mentioned that it's kind of been a myriad hodgepodge kind of way where you have someone like Lean Lab saying, hey, we're gonna provide hotspots for these folks. And then you have some other organization. How do we bring all those organizations together and utilize everything that we have at the state, local levels um, and, and kind of you know, make sure that what we are delivering is equitable education, whether they live in Western Kansas, in Blue Valley, or in the urban core. So I want to pose that question out to you all and say, hey, do you have any ideas of how we can make that work and how we can make that an equitable, deliverable education for all students, regardless of their zip code? 
So let, let me add to that because we're thinking along the same lines. And I would just simply summarize about how do we get this right? What have we learned? How do we get it right moving forward? Dr. Watson. I took BJ's lead. I'm going old school. So uh, thanks uh, for this discussion. I, I, there'll be a lot of discussion about the equitability of broadband, uh, hotspots, internet access, and there should be. But I, I want to take this in a little bit different direction as to what we learn and what we have to do going forward. We can't move entirely from a brick and mortar to a virtual environment and not think there's not social emotional damage that goes on when we do that with young people. So uh, I don't like for us to think in absolutes. The virus will certainly dictate a lot of what happens from a public health perspective. But I think we've got to be thinking about using community resources in a different way. Uh, so churches and community buildings and how do we separate kids in smaller environments, protect them in different ways. And yes, uh, uh, remote virtual learning will be a part of that. But what, it, what, what we're doing today, I think certainly can support social emotional learning, but it doesn't replace that interaction that is so deeply needed by too many of our kids, and we found that in the continuous learning plan where they need to have physical contact with a human adult and they need to have a safe environment. And, and other students may not need that as much. So we're gonna have to, I think, play with multiple environments going forward, which create real hardships on local boards and local decision-making because you're trying to customize that for your community and your families. And so as we think about the broadband, which I look forward to that discussion and how we help with that, I hope that we keep in mind that's not the only thing we have to think about in terms of equity as we go into whatever the fall and the spring and future years hold for us in this. Yeah, thank you for your input on that. And it truly will be a collaborative effort on all levels. Um, so we have a few hands raised. Dinah, I know that yours was probably first, and then I'll get to the others. So, Dinah? I think it may have been left over from a um, previous time because I didn't raise my hand, but I let, you know, I think we've got to look at the community resources. And, you know, my two children are very different, and my youngest was like, I, I want to see my friends. I want to be in the classroom. And I've, you know, had those conversations with him saying, okay, don't expect things to look exactly like they did before spring break. Um, you know, let's plan for the worst and um, adapt. And I was like, you know, it could be a couple hours at school and I don't know. So I think just adapting and yes, making sure that those kids who need, and I think all kids need some face-to-face -face time with those teachers and that's important. But Yes, I am taking notes myself on how to do this, so thank you. Okay. Absolutely. Oh, Carol. Yes, well, um, you know, I would, you know, I like to think, you know, big, <laughs> and this is what gets me in trouble, but, uh, you know, I think that we should suspend standardized testing. Georgia did it yesterday. They, they suspended the standardized testing for next year, the next academic year, just because, you know, my, my daughter, she took her ACT, she'll be a junior, but she took it here at home. I, I think that that piece, we should push and advocate for you know, just suspending that because any, if this, this time is in, it's anxiety provoking for anybody. So I think that we as, as leaders could push for you know, the, the suspension of that, at least for this year. California did away with it. They're not doing it anymore. But I think that is the biggest equity piece right there that we can work on as a community. It's really a powerful comment, Carol. So I'm wondering what our uh, friends on the Missouri side are thinking. How do we get this right? What are you thinking about moving forward? Yeah, and I noticed, Ingrid, if you want to touch on that, what's happening on the Missouri side in regards to that? Or Dr. Van Even? Uh, thank you. I um, didn't get to introduce myself. I represent a district that takes in Kansas City Public School District and the Independence Public School District, as well as uh, quite a few charter schools and uh, and some private schools. So we, it, it, tremendously diverse population anyway, but in terms of the educational delivery is very diverse as well. And I uh, am a 30 year veteran from education, starting in the Catholic schools and then ending as an elementary school uh, counselor. 
in the public schools. And I think from my perspective, the questions I think we need to be asking, this, I think this gives us an opportunity to get back to examining what it is that we're trying to do here. What is the goal? I've got three big questions that I kind of came to me as I was listening to the first session earlier today. What is the goal of our school systems? What are, we have so many demands placed on our schools. We're educating, we're supporting, we're providing for their safety, their health, their mental health, their welfare, their food delivery. And those are all very good things that we have to do in order to educate our children, no question about it. Uh, the question then is, who funds that? How do we, because what has happened is that we started with the premise that schools are there to educate our children and that's what we're going to get from our majority uh, Republican conservative legislature in Missouri. That's just what we're going to get, that the schools are not there to, to take care or to be the nanny. Is the, uh, that's, that's the narrative that we get. And so when we put in these extra programs, those are school dollars that go toward those programs and the schools start to have to compete with these social service agencies. The next question, the next big question I think we have then is, what is the role of our educators and our schools? And then finally, what is the role then of our community and our government? And I don't think we have clear answers for that. And I don't think we'll be able to really come up with solid, strong, deliverable plans until we do have good, good answers to those questions. Yeah, I think you're right. I think right now it's really highlighted some of those things in education and really it's been a reset. Like, what is this all about? We can kind of step back a little bit and look at it from a higher level overview and, you know, kind of determine what really is education. So I'd love to hear more from the Missouri side. So Dr. Van Even, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, thank you. Good to see you, Dr. Bur uh, Representative Burnett. Those are really good questions to be raised uh, for all of us. And um, I think these types of events are very important. Um, Dr. Watson and I will, he could share with you uh, that Sunday afternoon where right before schools were being called where we were on the phone with one another saying, how are you handling this? What are you doing? Because it's, it, it is a, a line, uh, a, a street in Kansas City that we, that we cross over. So what we do does impact one another. So thank you for this opportunity. Equity has certainly risen its head during this, uh, the, these school closures, and we must really pay close attention to that. You're right, we've served over 11 million meals to children uh, in Missouri right now in our schools. We have, um, the uh, Children's Division is contacting us because hotline calls are down by 50% right now because schools are not in session. Uh, we've done surveys, one in five children do not have appropriate access to the internet services that they need in order to be productive and successful working from home. So these are big issues that we need to address. I'd say that's probably where we are prioritizing. I understand um, Dr. Watson's point that it can't be the only focal point, but the reality is we are, we are only broadening that divide when we say that there are some kids who are thriving in this environment right now, and there are some that have uh, do not have resources or access to, to virtually anything right now. So really struggling. Um, what we're going to be doing about that is looking uh, with our CARES funds, working with the state team to talk about uh, how do we address it as a state. It's not just an education issue, it is a state issue. Uh, we're going to be working with how do we train our teachers better um, to, to do that. They, they've been kind of, their worlds have been upturned as well. They don't, not many of them do not know how to teach in this environment as we're all kind of struggling today, raising our hands and doing things differently. So how do we train our teachers um, to, to work in that environment differently? And then, um, you know, your question about testing, I think is an interesting one. Um, what we're going to be doing when, when our kids walk in the door in August, though, is asking that question, where are they? And, and we're trying to figure out how do we come up with a statewide tool that wouldn't be necessarily used for accountability purposes, but really on how do we know what, what kids advanced to think that every fourth grader is going to walk in the door as a fourth grader this year is, is uh, illogical. I mean, so, so where are they? What, how do we meet them where they are? How do we get them to where they need to be? Uh, so we will need some standardized mechanism to do that. And uh, right now it might look like a test, uh, probably will be a test, but not for accountability purposes really to get the uh, the information that we need so that we feel we can intervene appropriately. 
and then equip them with the tools in case this kind of thing does continue to surface throughout the year. Uh, we, we don't believe that this could be a short-term thing. We might have to pivot to this. That's the new word. Uh, how, how are people fully equipped to navigate in and out of our system? And in Missouri, uh, schools are paid on attendance. So we're trying to uh, figure out and how to navigate that so that that schools are not penalized when we're saying to parents, when we're saying to teachers, stay home if you're sick. Uh, that's a total paradigm shift for us as well. So just a number of issues. I could, I could probably go on and on and on, but I'll stop because I know many others have things to add. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Van Even. And I'm so glad that you mentioned what you did about, you know, when kiddos come back, we do need to have some bit of evaluation on where those kiddos are. Because at least from my experience working in the urban core, growing up um, in Blue Valley, you notice that a lot of what is lost is over the summer. So then we just put more fuel on that fire for a lot of kiddos who were learning a lot, or losing a lot of the skills that their suburban counterparts weren't necessarily losing throughout the summer. So I'm so glad you touched on that. I would love to go back to the Kansas side. So Senator Pat Petty. Thank you. Um, I appreciate everything I've heard. I would just add, I think this is certainly a, a time to take advantage of not pointing fingers and not a, a saying that like one school district did a better job or one uh, building did a better job than another. I think this is a time to definitely, um, uh, if I, I I'll, I'll say it's kind of silly, but circle the wagons and protect education and talk about uh, how hard uh, everyone has worked to step up to the plate, whether it's on the Missouri side or the Kansas side. I have grandchildren in, in Missouri and I have a daughter that works in the Missouri system. So I know what she's dealt with there and what she's dealt with with her son. And I have grandchildren that are on the Kansas side and, and of course I'm on the Kansas side. But I think it's so important to, to, to also focus on the fact that uh, as has been mentioned, that people stepped up, the teachers and parents stepped up to the plate and made a real effort, but it certainly has increased the, I hope we don't try to uh, whitewash the divide that we have between those in the Blue Valley District, let's say, and those in the Kansas City, Kansas District, and that those inequities aren't gonna go away, and those uh, issues uh, have been, if not highlighted, acerbated by this whole, by the fact that our schools were closed. I think Kansas did uh, do, the governor made a decision of closing our schools, and uh, that I believe that did help our uh, schools to be able to move into this mode of education. Um, and um, I think we now have just another piece of information that educators and administrators and the state board and boards of education are going to use to say uh, how can we make this piece better and work with what we do in buildings but I totally agree our kids need to be in school our families want them to be in school um, as a as a senator I hear that every day I get asked that question uh, what's going to happen next year that's the that's the uh, that's the question out there among people whether they have children in school or not but i I would just say we need to focus on the positives and we also need to, to remember and keep in front of us all of these disparities that are there and have been highlighted by this and we have to address. Right, yeah, and Senator Petty, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because it actually harkens back to what one student in our previous session was talking about. So often we're siloed. I don't think that he used that phrase, but so often we're like, oh, but Olathe is doing this or Blue Valley is doing this instead of being collaborative and working together. Um, I think that through all of this would be a great time for us to come together, call each other in and really see what best practices worked for all students. So I'd like to throw it over to Randy Lopez from KCK. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Um, so Randy Lopez with uh, USD 500. So six months into, uh, Yolanda and I are six months into our first year as board members, so brand new and, and really you know, learning a lot in, in these first six months and, and trying to see how best we can serve our community, right? Um, um, but before I get into that, you know, I just wanna recognize the significance of today, right? Uh, being Juneteenth and here we are talking about equity and seeing everything that's happening in our not just local communities, but nationally where we're seeing communities that have been 
that are crying out and 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 rallying and protesting and raising their voice and i think that that plays into you know our districts and how how we move forward and reimagine what our districts look like right so um, as we come back or as we think about how we come back making sure that we're including that community student family perspective as well and i'm i'm, I'm sad i missed the earlier session on on student and parent perspectives um, but I, but I'll bring that forward here to just say you know I I think there's opportunities for us to really engage and re-engage our families and be creative and and what that means I think that's something that families always talk about is how can we be better engaged in our student in our child education and as districts we're always saying how can we engage a parent into their because it's 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 so important to have that family engagement and as we think about what a family actually means and the extended families and and the family structure is so different for so many folks how do we engage those families as we move forward relationships are so important um i think it was uh, uh randy watson who talked about the the trauma piece right and all we all know that the, the data shows all it takes is one caring adult to make an impact on a child's life who has suffered trauma how do we do that in a place where we might be virtual or where we might have a mix, a mix of virtual and in-person uh, learning? How do we build those relationships with those students moving forward and, and making sure that they're genuine and authentic, caring relationships with those students and their families? And then, I, I, you know, I mentioned again, everything happening nationally in our country around, um, um, you know, raising up community voice and making sure that that's important. That's just as important in our local school districts to make sure that we are listening to our parents, listening to our community members, listening to our students, and, and taking that information uh, and in order to make uh, more thoughtful decisions that will af affect and impact them directly. So how do we do a better job of listening to the voice of those that we serve as districts and not just making decisions for them without them? So I, I think those will be some really important things. And then also an opportunity to really look at our own systems within the district um, what policies and practices that we have do we have in place that continue to perpetuate those inequities that we see in our daily lives? So I think those are some other things that we, we need to be looking at as well. Can I add something, Kevin? Sure, go ahead. Um, I was also, you know, I think, you know, we have a great narrative now. I mean, parents who maybe have not always appreciated the jobs that our teachers and schools do you know they're seeing the differences between their children and the one kid who is very um, motivated and gets everything done and then the one who gets distracted and says oh it's a butterfly or you know having try so I think you know we have an excellent opportunity um, as parents you know probably have a better appreciation for what our schools do and all of the services that they provide um, I mean lunch, um, the mental health. I mean, I know as a parent and I have two high school students, but I was like, how can you continue to eat like constantly? And so I think it's a great opportunity for us to message, you know, the importance and what all that our comments. Let's bring um, Dr. Rodriguez in and share your perspective on equity and, and what you're trying to do to address it in your community. Well, I think everything that everybody already said, first of all, I mean, that's what we feel uh, at the school site level. Um, so for my superintendent's seat, um, you know, uh, every single one of those pieces. So Representative Burnett, your challenges and the things that you bring up, um, we feel every single one of those and all those challenges. Uh, you know, Dr. Van, you even mentioned the 50% um, lower uh, hotline calls. That is another thing that we are talking about um, regularly because we, we have a good sense of what our students have done and where they are, but when they're coming back to us, we will have not seen them in almost six months. And so there will be so many different things that have happened during that time that, that could be traumatic. We've had some that have progressed, some that have not progressed. And so um, I'm on one of the, one of the committees, fortunately, and, and our discussion centered around the first week of school can't just be about trying to assess where they are academically. We have to talk to our kids. We have to have that face to face and understand where they are and what's going on. Um, as was mentioned, the, the equity issues um, that are going on were only highlighted by this pandemic. They were already there before. Now we're just seeing them. So my hope is that we can actually start to make some dramatic changes. I mean, 
this is going to be probably one of the most difficult school years that maybe any of us have ever gone through. Um, but I know Dr. Van even shares this as well, but it, and has said this to us multiple times, I mean, it can also be one of the most exciting. Um, we have an opportunity here. We have an opportunity now with the relationships that we've built with parents that are different, that they understand and know maybe a little bit different, um, having their students that have been home with them for this amount of time. I've had several parents contact me. And it's like, I get it now. My son or my, my child has had these issues. And I always thought that maybe this was a school issue. And this is clearly a challenge with my son. What can we do? What can we do with my daughter? How can we help? And, and what can we uh, partner together? So I think if we don't take advantage of that opportunity to truly partner this year with our community and with our parents, we've lost um, uh, an amazing opportunity. The equity side has to be there and hopefully now will be in every single one of our decisions, not just that we're um, maybe pulling in some things about race every once in a while and we're talking about this stuff every once in a while and we're looking at our discipline data every once in a while, but every single decision that we start looking at and that we make, that we start thinking about, is this truly equitable? And it's not just about race, but there's all these other marginalized groups that we have to make sure that we are including in our decisions and that we're looking at all the different perspectives. So. I think for us, we've had those things in place, but we're not as far along as we want to be. So I'm excited because I feel like we can actually take multiple steps forward. Whereas like every year we've kind of taken a step forward where now we need to be taking leaps and we need to be pushing this forward even more. Thank you for that. You know, it, it's complicated. Let me just ask, and you can build on this question. So as policymakers and all the issues that have surfaced and also the opportunities to strengthen relationships, how are we thinking about uh, reprioritizing what we currently spend money on? And how are we thinking about changing funding away from seat time to a system that allows for that personalization of learning? Well, you know, this is Carol again. I, you know, I, I want to go back, you know, to the, the social emotional as it, fit, as it ties in with equity, but the state of Missouri passed House Bill 604 this year, but it established a voluntary pilot program beginning in 2020 to provide social and emotional health education in elementary schools. Kansas doesn't have anything like that. But I think if we could start, you know, just implementing making that required here in the state of Kansas, that can definitely make an impact, especially because I'm a, I have my background is in domestic violence and sexual assault. I work at a sexual assault center and we have seen our calls drop in half, but the calls that we do get are more complicated. So yeah, I would, I would really advocate for the social and emotional health being required to have at least mental health in Kansas. So kudos, to, kudos to Missouri, thank you. Redirecting some funding to support that. Who else would like to jump in on that conversation? If I could, I think it's important to talk about KCPS's tiered funding model um, because I think this kind of helps the way that we spend some of our dollars um, that is relatively unique, right? So our, our policy uh, equity is 0, 0.0 in our policy handbook. So it's at the beginning of everything and at the end of everything that we do. Um, and so we've established a tiered funding model that allows for us to reprioritize dollars um, based on some of those uh, needs that we've just talked about. And so uh, I think that as I look at other groups and, and even government bodies, that type of priority to funds, I think is necessary to truly equal the equity we're looking for in these systems. Thank you. May I ask Mr. Shields, Charlie, would you respond from your viewpoint as a state board leader? Well, I want to go back a little bit to the equity issue and, and talk about why that's such a challenge. Uh, so obviously, uh, you have a lot of work happening within districts to create equity, and, and uh, we just heard from uh, KCPS about that. But at the, the broader state level, um, the challenge uh, for states like Missouri, and we have 518 school districts plus uh, another probably 40 um, charters, and you know we have uh, problems with equity and funding because we have a, a, a funding formula that was based, you know, not on equity, it was based on adequacy. So, uh, and that's like many states, it says, you know, what is the minimum level it takes to adequately educate a child? And if local communities want to do more, uh, they have their ability to tax themselves and do that. So uh, that's a long standing tradition in Missouri and a lot of states. I think at some point policymakers uh, will continue to look at that. And then this issue uh, that a lot of people have talked about uh, Missouri 
being a very diverse state in terms of geography, uh, the ability and access to technology. Um, so, you know, if you live in many communities, you just take it for granted uh, that you have access to broadband. Uh, but what we found through all this is that we had issues, uh, not just access to broadband, but actually uh, the economic access to the, the devices themselves. And uh, you know, as we went through this, uh, that also raised its head in terms of, of the equity issue. So there's a lot uh, to look at, I think, long term uh, from a policymaker standpoint. And uh, so, you know, that's why uh, we have Representative Kelly and uh, Representative Burnett uh, on the line, because uh, those are the kind of issues they have to address. Thank you. Anyone else want to weigh in on the equity issue or reprioritizing our funding? This is Yolanda. Um, I will weigh in on the equity issue. I just want to say, we all wear different hats and so from the board perspective and also as a parent i think that one thing that we will have to continue to look at is how we even communicate with our with our students and so making sure that we're fluid and we're consistent in how communication is happening happening with each one of our students and that goes from each class and each teacher um because there's been a it was a very variation of communication that was happening throughout the last school year and it was great teachers were doing what they could but as we continue to move forward, how do we make that consistent so our students know what to expect? So that makes me uh, want to think about what are some of the most effective strategies that our students, our parents, our families and community can engage with you all that are trying to uh, adapt our policies as we move forward. What have you seen that works well? I would like to just go back and to make one more point about the equity piece that we haven't really touched on in the discussion this morning earlier this morning or today and that's the role of the employers when we're talking about equity there's a for parents there's a big piece there about which parents can take off work to go to school for parent teacher conferences to participate in field trips to be able to communicate with teachers even just to have a phone call and there are other parents who will lose their job and that's a reality for them. They will lose their job if they take that time and they cannot do that during during school hours. So again, I, I think when we start talking about how we're going to restructure, we need to really be taking a look at the role the broader community plays, our employers, our service providers, our healthcare providers, and how we fund that beyond going making the school a pass-through uh, system it, that and i'll just leave it at that thanks representative Burnett, i'm going to push you to share more what have you been thinking about as a policy maker that might help address that well i think as a policy it, for me i it, <laughs> i would put in a policy i would require that that employers allow parents time off as part of the uh, is, is paid time off. I would I would require that employers, um, or maybe not require, but but companies that take advantage of some of our um, tax cuts are would would be required to provide some sort of um, daycare, preschool, early childhood education for their employees at even at a reduced cost uh, that that we when we give those kinds of cuts we direct them in a way that is going to improve our community that is that is not that it, that is taking a hit because of those tax cuts which would be our school communities those are some ideas those are great anyone else want to add to that dr van dieven Thank you. Yeah, I would just like to add to that. I think this is the time to have those kinds of conversations for this reason. Again, we we would really like to be able to open schools in the fall. I think probably most of us on this call would really like to be able to see our kids back in, in a face-to-face -face environment in the fall. Um, and we'd like to be able to keep our schools open. And what we're hearing from our health department is in order to do that, we have to be very safe in what we're doing. And so making sure that the number one thing we're communicating to families is that they keep their children home if they're sick, which is very, again, a very big paradigm shift. If we're going to ask parents to keep children home when they're sick, we're going to have to ask employers 
to be a bit flexible with their with their parents who have children. And so I think this is the time to have those kinds of conversations. It probably won't be in place by the fall, but it will certainly give us an avenue uh, to, to understand where those obstacles are. PJ. Um, I wanted to kind of jump in with two things. I think part and parcel with this conversation is also a larger conversation about the importance of child care and access to early child education. Um, it's interesting because, I mean, we hear a lot about reopening the economy. And I think the one thing that sometimes is always missing from that discussion is if you don't have adequate access to child care, especially when schools, school buildings aren't open, you cannot reopen the economy. And I think, again, like we've talked about today, the COVID-19 pandemic has just highlighted existing um, issues in our system. And I think one of the things that the governor's office and specifically the governor is really interested in is how do we take this time to, I think Senator Sykes mentioned it and other folks mentioned it, highlight the importance of these critical things that may have been forgotten in the conversation before. Um, child care, for example, um, access to nutrition assistance programs, all of these kind of core services that are really critical parts of our community that we need to be investing in more. And one of the things I know, Dr. Lane, we've talked about quite a bit is the public-private partnership piece in relation to childcare um, and creating incentive programs, creating investments to highlight to businesses and communities the importance of childcare as an economic development tool within their communities and how access to childcare is a fundamental part of community building, especially in rural Kansas, um, where that access is difficult. And the one other point that I'll make, and I think kind of to undergird what Dr. Watson was talking about is from a public health background, no matter what sort of crisis you have, public health is about prevention and preparedness. And I think one of the things that the governor's office here, again, under the goal of making sure that we have students in school, is what resources can we give our schools to make sure that they're, they can be safe? So what sorts of equipment can we provide our schools? How can we change the infrastructure? And I think for us, it's one, how do we ensure that we're reimbursing schools for the costs that they've already taken from the pandemic, but to protect their funding, like Senator Petty was saying, and then think about moving forward, what are the infrastructure changes to make schools a little bit safer for a pandemic um, so that students can stay um, in school and we don't have to have this dramatic shifts that maybe we'd seen in the in the fall. So the two points I think are investments in childcare and the importance of those and also making sure we have that preparedness piece so schools have the health resources they need to um, adequately support their students and their families. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, go ahead. Okay, I agree. And I think that affordable childcare is so important. You know, I was hearing from constituents who um, were working from home. Um, some didn't want to send their kids to um, childcare, but they were still paying, sometimes paying more. And then even, you know, those first responders, healthcare workers, their kids were there and um, you know, having to pay more, it, it just, affordable childcare has to be a conversation that we have um, and I love the talk about making employers, you know, having that conversation with them to say, hey, if you're getting tax credits, um, let's focus on, you know, education and kids and um, hopefully this will open up more of those conversations because, you know, those early years, years are so important. Yeah, and Dinah, I'm so glad that you said that and you provided a perfect segue for me. Um, because a lot of the issues that were raised today aren't new. A lot of these issues have been persistent throughout the years, and that's why we created this education uh, series. So we've, we've identified five different areas that we'd like to touch upon. Um, so we have five different breakout sessions this afternoon that further go into some of those, and then that will help us to refine and craft the work that we will be doing in the fall. Um, so after today, like Cindy had said earlier, we will compile everything that we have heard from a broad variety of voices, and we will then present those plans and some recommendations and some highlighting some issues and some opportunities um, that we've noticed. So I would love to thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your voice. Um, so at this time, go ahead and take a break, and we will resume back at 1 
right? 1 p.m. for our town hall. Cindy, do you have anything to add? No, just thank you all panelists for taking some time so that our uh, broader stakeholders could hear some of your thinking about where we're headed and, and how we're gonna get this right. Your time is invaluable, your service is invaluable. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you.